Hi guys, how's it going? Welcome back. It's our first lesson after fall break. Yeah, one quarter done, three to go till another summer break. Woo! Cool, all right. Well, today is a very, very big lesson that's very important. Uh, it is about American imperialism. So what is imperialism? That is a new word, kind of, a new word that we need to learn in this class. Imperialism means just when one country tries to kind of take over or strongly influence other countries. And this is when the United States really starts to show up in the world and tries to like flex on everybody, okay? So, a couple of things I just wanted to point out before we really get started. First of all, I'm wearing a very, very fantastic shirt this time. I think this one's my favorite. Um, I promised to deliver more shirts uh, in one of my videos and then I just wore regular shirts for like two or three videos. Lame. So this time I really delivered. I hope you love it. Second thing, I had several people call me out about not showing off my bare feet. What am I doing? So I'm back at it, bare feet back in this. Third thing, I'm wearing the Viking helmet because imperialism means people trying to take over or influence other people, just like the Vikings tried to do with Europe and the Mediterranean world. Now I'm putting my own flavor on it, American imperialism. Woo! Yes, all right. Let me check the video, make sure we're running strong. Everything looks great, no glares. And let's do it! First one! Aha! Uh -huh. I'm excited to be back, y'all, and I hope y'all are too. Very good, very good, very good. All right, US 19. We're already 19 standards in. Good job, y'all. We are learning about the causes of American imperialism in the late 19th and early 20th century, so we are in the late, good grief, late 1800s. Late 1800s and early 1900s. So remember, the time period that we've been in and we're still in is 1890, roughly, to 1920, roughly, okay? So, excuse me real quick. <coughs> Sorry, not sick, I promise, okay? Describe the causes of American imperialism, desire for new raw materials and new markets, okay? Desire to spread American democratic and moral ideals. Remember Manifest Destiny? Coming back to that. And yellow journalism. Okay, so I can break down the standard for you super fast and it'll be very, very easy to learn. Raw materials and new markets. Raw materials, that's very simple things like rubber, iron and steel, oil, anything that is not made into something yet but can be made into something and then sold. And new markets, new markets, that means people who don't have that stuff, you want to sell your stuff to them and make lots of money, okay? So, first one, first thing you know about imperialism, it's money. Oh, yes. Second thing, democratic and moral ideals, okay? America is awesome. That's what they're saying. So, if you want to be part of us, join us. We're just going to take you over, okay? And third thing, yellow journalism. Now this is when things get weird and something we really shouldn't be proud of. This is when the news kind of exaggerates. Uh-oh, oh, I'm out of space. Okay, there we go. We'll talk more about that specific one later. But basically what you need to know is this part right here. The reason why America starts trying to take over other places for money and because we think at the time in 1890, 1920, we're better than everyone. Okay, remember social Darwinists? These are the people making decisions right here. Okay, all right, cool. Very good, very good. Let's rock and roll. Hope y'all are doing great. Please email me if you need anything and uh, let's do this thing. So it says, during the late 1800s, early 1900s, America starts to expand. Now here's the thing, what were people doing from around the world towards the United States. Get all kinds of new immigrants in the United States. America's really starting to get lots of money. America's expanding. They've already expanded across the continent with the Transcontinental Railroad. I told you, we're never gonna get away from that thing. Ugh. Transcontinental Railroad, we've expanded all the way to the Pacific, and now what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna spread our wings even more. America is gonna try to show up on the global scene and start taking over other countries. And isn't it kind of ironic we fought a revolution because we didn't want to be controlled by another country? Didn't that happen? Oh yeah, that did happen, didn't it? Yeah, hmm, America, man oh man. All right, but anyway, America is trying to extend its power and influence around the world, and that's called imperialism, okay? 
Cool. Very good. All right. So like I told you before, two reasons are driving America towards doing this. Raw materials, which is stuff that you build out of, okay? So steel, oil, rubber to make, to make tires and things like that. So any kind of like lumber even, wood, okay? So anything that is a basic material in the earth that you can extract and then turn it into something that you can sell to a new market. So another country that doesn't have as much as we have, they wanna go there and they wanna sell a bunch of stuff to them, okay? So remember, we always gotta look at these cartoons it says, after all, the Philippines are only the stepping stone to China. Okay, we're going to learn about the Philippines and what the United States did there. It's not great. Um, and uh, what they're doing is trying to make business deals with China. Remember, China's huge. Okay, China's bigger than the United States. So, the United States wants to start doing business with them. Because remember, at the end of the day, what this all boils down to, imperialism, excuse me, is all about this right here. Money! All right, all right, cool. Raw materials, stuff you make stuff out of, new markets, new places to go sell. Cool, money! All right, rock and roll. All right, so as we talked about in the Gilded Age, remember making these connections. Uh, America is ready to expand, we got tons and tons and tons of money, and now we just need more people to buy this stuff, okay? Sell, make tons of money, that's what it's about. Raw materials, you can go to the rainforest and get all kinds of lumber. You can go to the Middle East and get oil. And they're figuring out all this stuff and they're like, hmm, we gotta get this money. So raw materials is how you get it because you gotta start building stuff that you wanna sell. All right, all right. All right, now, here is where it changes up just a little bit and it goes back to this. By the way, this is a horrible cartoon and we're gonna look at it. Um, social Darwinism exceptionalism and manifest destiny. Okay, so let's take it back to eighth grade. Sorry, can I, I'm gonna take this off just for a little bit. My head is hot. I think it grew over fall break. Man, oh man. So manifest destiny, if you remember from eighth grade, okay, that is when America expanded west because the colonists, they really thought that they were better than the Native Americans. And they said, hey, the way we live is the way. It is the best way no, everybody should be living like this. Nobody needs to be anything different. America is number one, okay? And that's the basic idea of manifest destiny. You expand because you're awesome, okay? Now, that takes us to the next one, American exceptionalism. Why are you awesome? It's because you're an American, okay? Nobody's better than America. This was the belief back then. This is just, I'm just making a point. This was the belief that Americans were better and therefore they have to expand and uh, everybody else should be like us. And so we are going to go out and we're going to influence everybody because democracy is the best way. Industry is the best way. And of course, to these people back then, Christianity was the best way because everyone else is kind of a savage. And I don't mean like a savage, like cool. A savage is in they are less developed. They're not as civilized, all these things, okay? Now, this was the thought process. Remember, this is not what we believe now. This is definitely not what I believe. I'm just telling you what the thought process was during the age of imperialism, okay? Now, I'm gonna show you this cartoon, and I'm a little bit nervous about it because this, is a, this has a lot of racism in this cartoon. Okay, so let's check it out. <laughs> Excuse me, getting excited, getting out of breath. Goodness. All right, so here we have Uncle Sam, USA. So let's label it just so we know. USA. Notice over here, doing chores is an African American. Notice he is depicted in a way that would be considered offensive. So this is another example of a racist thing, a racist political cartoon, okay? Now, if we notice, I'm not being weird when I say any of this. I promise I'm not meaning any weird feelings. I'm just analyzing the cartoon from a historical perspective. All of the children back here, they're well behaved. Whoops. Oh, no. Hang on. Ah, give me two seconds. Don't go away. It's coming back right now. There we go. I'm back. All right. So back to the cartoon. So we got the USA. He is teaching the class. All these students back here. 
are well behaved. Remember, I'm not being weird, but look, they're predominantly white students, okay? So what is that message there? That these Americans, these white Americans here, these Westerners are well behaved, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Now, if we look in the front row, actually, let's just look in the back. Notice, someone with Asian features, and particularly the hat, this is representative of China. Remember the Chinese Exclusion Act? Okay. This is a depiction of literally excluding Chinese influence, China, America's influence on China. They're saying, we're not interested in dealing with them as far as uh, a moral way. We want to deal with them with business because we don't care. We want to make money however we can get it. But we, we don't want them. We're excluding the Chinese. Look at this. He's a Native American. Look, he's reading the book upside down. This cartoon, this is another racist feature of this cartoon. Okay, it's so saying Native Americans aren't, they're more, they're more savage. Okay, that's what the cartoon's saying. Okay, now lastly, we've got Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines. And if you look, the USA, Uncle Sam, is getting on to them. And if you look at them, based on their physical demeanor, it looks like they're misbehaving. Uh, they're probably the problem students, as you would say, okay? Uh, and uh, their body language just says they're not interested, okay? But notice the USA is getting on to them, okay? So this is a racist cartoon. It honestly makes me uncomfortable to talk about because uh, I don't like to talk about this stuff. Uh, but you can see that during the age of imperialism, this was kind of the belief that the USA was better than everyone else, that the Americans were doing what they were supposed to do and everybody else has to be corrected. America has to expand its influence on other countries, okay? All right, let's move away from that one. Woo! All right, so there it is again. Okay, now, yellow journalism. What this is, it is exaggerated news, or it's sometimes news that is sensationalized, and it might even tell not necessarily lies, but also not the full truth, okay? And the point of doing this is to get the public excited and to get the public to get fired up about doing some type of change. Now at the time, and I'll get more into this later, we'll talk about the specific things, America wanted to take over Cuba because of access to raw materials and new markets. Remember, money was everything to these imperialists. All right? So, an example of yellow journalism is this right here. It says, Spanish ships on our coast Mysterious warships seen by incoming vessels may be privateers. Oh, my goodness. Now, if you're an American and you're reading this and you're worried about privateers, pirates from Spain, how are you going to feel about Spain all of a sudden because you read this newspaper? You might be scared. You might be angry. But most of all, you're going to be fired up and you're going to want to take action. You're going to want the United States to take action. So yellow journalism it's a type of news that exaggerates things to get the public really excited to go do something, okay? And for example, Spanish ships on our coast. Now, the news today is pretty exciting all the time, all the time, it's very exciting. I'm not saying yellow journalism exists anymore, but I'm also saying it doesn't not exist. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay, so yellow journalism is just a way for news to be very, very exciting. And news, I mean, news should be exciting, okay? All right, all right, let's rock and roll. I don't read the news, so. And I know as a social studies teacher, that sounds terrible, but I study history, okay? All right, all right. So yellow journalism pushed American enthusiasm toward joining the Spanish-American War. And we're gonna talk about that here very, very soon, okay? And we'll talk about all this too. All right, so what is imperialism? It's when one country when one country tries to take over or strongly influence another country strongly influence another country Remember to take breaks, pause as needed. Okay. 
What basis did the American government use to promote American imperialism? Okay, there are three reasons, okay? It is access to raw materials. Remember, raw materials are things like oil, steel, lumber, uh, anything that you can turn into something that you can then sell. Access to raw materials, and where do they want to sell it? In new markets, other countries. They want to go to other countries and be like, look at all of our awesome stuff. You want to buy it? That's exactly what happened, okay? Access to raw materials and new markets. What's another reason? That's number one. Um, American, promoting American ideals, okay? So ideals, that's things like democracy, Christianity, that goes back to that manifest destiny. We have a right to take over the world because we're America and we're awesome, we're better than you. That's what people believed back then, okay? Promoting American ideals. And last one, it's that weird kind of news that gets people excited to go do something, and particularly back then, go to war with Spain, yellow journalism, and it actually tells you right there. Yellow journalism. All right, now, define yellow journalism. So what is yellow journalism? It's news that is exaggerated. So it's like very, like, whoa, it may not actually be real facts. They might be real facts, but they're worded in a way that gets you real excited. News that is exaggerated to get people excited. To get people excited. All right, there we go. We're doing good on time. That one only took about 15 minutes. Awesome, cool. That's one standard down. So let's move on. Remember to pause if you need to, email me if you need to. Uh, hopefully you understand what imperialism is and the reasons why. Uh, pause there if you need them again. So let's rock and roll. Here we go. All right. So this is very, very easy. Super easy, in fact. Uh, it says, we are learning about the arguments of interventionists and non-interventionists. Who are interventionists? They are imperialists. In other words, people who think we should intervene, and intervention is when you get involved, when you get involved in somebody else's business, uh, AKA an imperialist, going to other countries and being like, hey, we're taking over here because we don't like what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. That's an interventionist or an imperialist, okay? Non-interventionist, well, what do you think that is? Someone who is an anti-imperialist. You could say non-imperialist, that's not really a word, they say anti-imperialist. Now, Honestly, this standard is a little silly. I think it could be included with the last one. But we'll break down the reasons why these two groups exist. But I think you can think of why. First of all, what is the main motivation for these people? Why, is, why does the government really want to go to other places and take over stuff? It all goes to this right here. Okay? It's very simple. Imperialists want to make money. They think they're the best. You want to make money with us, don't you? Come by with us. Let's trade. Let's make a deal. And everybody's going to be happy. And we'll all be like, us, America, okay? That's the imperialists, all right? Anti-imperialists, these are the people who look at America honestly at the time back then and they say, hey, aren't we a democracy who fought a revolutionary war because we want rights for all people, because we believe in that all men are created equal, all this and that, and if you're going to take over somewhere else, is that being truly American, democratic, uh, being equal? Uh, no, okay? So, these are the people whose morals make them say no to imperialism. They are, they believe, hey man, this ain't good, okay? And honestly, these people, in my opinion, in 2020, I think these are the people that we need to be on their side, okay? Because if you look at it, you can't go take over another country and be a democracy where the people rule because you're taking away the power of the people that you're taking over. But anyway, that's the short of it. Now let's go to the long of it. All right, interventionists. They want to show off. They were the Americans at the time who said, look at us, we got money, we got stuff, we got one of these, don't you want to trade with us and make lots of money? And yeah, that's basically the idea. They want to show off America's strength. Look at all the stuff we made during the Gilded Age. Aren't we fantastic? Look at our cool industry. Sell, buy, America, okay? Open foreign markets, same thing I just said, and allowed our Navy to expand globally. So what they want to do is they're really just really wanting to show off. Interventionists or imperialists, they want to show off and they want to make money, okay? And you can see the cartoon there. I need to get a sip of water. Woo! 
I'm hyper damn excited. I'm glad to be back. I'm also glad that we're talking about something a little more interesting than the progressive era. Not that the progressive era is not interesting, it's just a lot of laws, okay? All right, moving on. Anti-imperialists will be next. Like I already told you, first of all, they believe that it's not okay for America as a democracy to take away other people's rights. But secondly, they're pretty smart in that they're worried about this right here, that it would cause military conflict. They do not want to get involved in a war. And we're going to see that unfortunately these people are going to lose out on this battle. And eventually it's going to get us into a major, major problem called World War I. Whoops! Okay? Now, but that's, much, that's a topic for much later. And it was hypocritical for a democratic country to take over another country. Hopefully you understand what that means. Democracy means the people really do have the power. We have a voice. We have the power. And if a, a country that says the people have the power goes and takes over another country where people live, and they're saying, hey, you, you, we're, you're under our control now, that's not okay based on democracy, okay? So they call, they're calling imperialists hypocrites. <laughs> hypocrites, excuse me. All right, all right, moving on. All right, so what arguments did interventionists or imperialists use to support American imperialism, okay? So... Uh, first of all, they want to make money. They want to promote American ideals such as democracy, Christianity, etc. Thirdly, what is this going to show? America is strong. Show America's strength. And lastly, to for our Navy can kind of patrol the world, okay? Expand the Navy. Expand the Navy. And this is actually, um, that's a good thing that that happened, okay? Got two friends in the Navy, so I very much support the Navy, all right? Number five, what arguments did non-interventionists or anti-imperialists use to oppose American imperialism? All right, so they say, first of all, let's not get in a war. Because when you get involved in other places and you go somewhere and you say, hey, we're going to take over here, sometimes the people are going to fight back. And that's actually what happens in basically all of these cases. The people start fighting back. They're like, oh, you can't do this. Okay. But of course, America is very strong, had lots of money, and money equals back in this day and age guns. Okay. So America was pretty strong. So we're going to beat all these people who say uh, we're going to fight back. Uh, let's not get in a war. And secondly, it's hypocritical. Or a democracy to take over other countries. It's a lot of writing. There we go. And that makes perfect sense. You can't be a country who says, hey, we want the people to have the power, and then you go to another country and say, hey, Y'all don't have any power, we have all the power, okay? So, imperialists, they want to make money, they want, they think America's awesome, so they want to show off, and they want to expand, they just want global presence, they want to be strong, okay? So that's imperialists or interventionists, same thing. Non-interventionists or anti-imperialists, they say, hey, this could get us into a war, which they're right, and they also say it's, it's a, a democracy can't take away other people's rights, okay? All right, cool. Pause it if you need it. We're doing really great on time. And let's move on. I think we're halfway done right here. All right, so we finally, finally get to learn about war. Um, as, a, as a student of history and a teacher of history, I like to study wars. I think they're very interesting. I think it's really wild that humans can get to a level where they're willing to kill other humans just for really, especially in this case, not much. Um, there's really no point in it, and so war to me is very interesting. It also makes for good discussion as far as uh, the facts are more interesting than learning about the 17th Amendment, um, you know, where people choose senators and not the state legislatures, okay? So uh, this stuff is very interesting. So our first war, Spanish-American War, here we go. Ready? Ready. All right, so back then, Spain controlled Cuba. Cuba is just south of Florida, okay? Uh, Cuba was under the control of Spain. 
Spain was not being nice to the Cubans, okay? So Spain was mean to Cuba. And we're gonna talk more about this in just a second. I'm just gonna break it down, okay? Spain was mean to Cuba. So Cubans wanna be free. Cubans want freedom, all right? Cubans want freedom. And the United States sees the island of Cuba and they have sugar there. Ah, sugar can be sold for lots and lots of money and it can be turned into beautiful little treats and things like that. Sugar is used in a lot of things and it can make a lot of money. And the United States sees this and they see dollar signs of Cuba. They're like, ah, sugar money, sweet. And so they say, hey Cuba, want some help in your little problem with Spain here? And Cuba's like, yes. Okay, and so that's what we're talking about here. So if we see, we've got Spanish conquistador looking guys, they, they symbolize Spain. This guy is the USA, and this lady who's being protected by the American flag symbolizes Cuba. And this is the USA, like I said, and these guys are Spanish, Spain there, okay? So you can see the United States sees a plan. They say, hey, Cuba, Spain's being mean to y'all. You want some help? And in, certain, in exchange, we're gonna take over y'all and then make lots of money, okay? They didn't know that yet though, but here we go. So, Spain goes to war with America, all right? And we'll talk about the reasons why here in just a moment. Spain goes to war with America. And at the time, Spain controlled the Philippines, they controlled Puerto Rico and Cuba. The United States is going to win this war. So what does that mean the United States is going to get? They're going to get the Philippines. They're going to get Cuba and Puerto Rico. Okay. So all of these colonies, except for Cuba, and we'll talk more about Cuba later. They, they, don't, they don't follow the rules. They stick with uh, Spain. These guys are going to become part of the United States territory. Okay. Puerto Rico, Philippines, and Guam. All right. All right. So here's why it starts. Here's the whole reason for it. And we got a little bit of ahead of ourselves there. But here's why it happens. So the Spanish are not being nice to the Cubans. And because of that, Cubans start to revolt, all right? And uh, the United States is just looking on at this situation like, yo, this is very close to Florida. Maybe we need to keep an eye on this, okay? So Spain is losing control because the Cubans are revolting. They're fighting back, and Spain is starting to lose this war in Cuba. And the United States, like I said, they see an opportunity. So they send warships down there. Now, and what's the problem with that? You got Spanish warships already there fighting the Cubans, and now all of a sudden you've got American warships just showing up. What is Spain gonna think? Hmm, they're probably gonna think that the United States wants to get involved in a war, and that's kind of what happens. Let's see what happens next. So Spain is mistreating Cuba. The Cubans are fighting back against the Spanish. All right, there was a boat. I'm gonna show you some pictures. There was a boat in a harbor in Cuba. I believe it was in Havana. Okay, let's see. Da, da, da. Yep, it's called the USS Maine. The USS Maine, and that's it right there, okay? One night in Havana Harbor in 1898, I think the date might be on here. Uh, nope, remember, I don't care about dates. I just care about what happens, okay? So, one night in Havana Harbor in Cuba, the United States warship called the Maine blows up. Now notice what I said, the USS Maine explodes. That is the only fact we know about that night as far as what happened to the Maine. It blew up. We don't know who did it. We don't know how it happened. We don't know why it happened. All we know is that a United States warship called the USS Maine, a ship that belongs to the United States government, blows up. Like I said, we don't know who did it. But, Aren't there Spanish warships there? And don't we have a little problem with Spain mistreating Cuba right now? And don't we want to be beautiful, wonderful, great Americans and help out the Cubans? And all of a sudden, the Maine explodes? <gasps> Who could have done this except for the Spanish? The bloodthirsty Spaniards, okay? So here's what happens. Here's what happens. We get a huge explosion of news stories. And guess what kind of news we have now? This is born. Yellow journalism. Yellow journalism is born, okay? 
What is yellow journalism? It's news that exaggerates and sensationalizes stories to get people interested and excited about something. So the USS Maine explodes. We don't know if the Spanish did it or not, but the news gets a hold of this. They know the government wants to take over Cuba. They know that they want the Spanish out so that they can take over Cuba. So the news writes all these stories about how Spain blew up the USS Maine. Uh -huh. The USS Maine was bought up by the Spanish. Oh no! Yellow journals, we don't know what happened, okay? All right. So moving on. Come on. All right, so we're going to talk about Hawaii in a second. So let's break down the Spanish-American War with Cuba, okay? Cuba involved. And by the way, look at this artwork. This is yellow journalism, too. These people getting blown way up into the sky, and it, it was the bloodthirsty Spaniards, for sure. So anyway, the, the Spanish-American War in Cuba. Spain controlled Cuba. The Cubans were being mistreated. The Cubans fight back. The United States sees a money opportunity to, to get involved with the sugar trade, okay? So they send warships there. All of a sudden, the USS Maine explodes in 1898, and now we're fighting a war against Spain, all right? And we're going to beat them, by the way, okay? All right, moving on. Now, <laughs> also at the same time, Hawaii. America has its eye on Hawaii, okay? Now, I told you earlier that Spain controlled a country called the Philippines. Okay? The Philippines is way over, it is an Asian country, okay? So it's in Asia. It's literally across the Pacific Ocean, a long way. Well, there's an island about halfway across the Pacific. Hmm, it's called Hawaii. So what this becomes is a stepping stone, is what we'll call it. A stepping stone, okay? It is a stepping stone on the way to fight the Spanish in the Philippines. So, the United States realizes, hey, we're gonna have to fight the Spanish all around the world because we want all their colonies. We're mad at them now because they blew up the Maine. They blew up the Maine, okay? So, Hawaii at the time was a sovereign nation. They were independent. Nobody controlled Hawaii. They were doing their own thing, okay? And there was a queen of Hawaii. Her name was Queen Liliuo Kalani. We call her Queen Lily, okay? So Queen Lily. The United States approaches Queen Lily and they say, hey, we want to use Hawaii just as a naval base because we're fighting the Spanish, okay? We, uh, we believe, you know, we, we're not going to do anything mean to you. We're not going to take it over. We're just going to use Hawaii. It's just a little naval base on our way to the Philippines. We are not taking over Hawaii. That's what America says to Hawaii at the time. Well, here's the thing. When America starts going to visit Hawaii on the way to the Philippines, look what they notice. Wealthy sugar plantations. You got social Darwinists involved who look down and they're like, hey, we can make some money here. These people are Native Americans. Let's take it over, okay? So Queen Lily, she gets overthrown by the Americans. Uh, the Americans told the Hawaii, like I said, they said, hey, we're just going to use this as a naval base on our way to the Philippines. We're not going to bother you. But Marines show up. The United States Marines show up on Hawaii's beaches. And guess what? They overthrow Queen Lily and they basically take over Hawaii. And it does become a state in the 1950s, I believe. Okay. So there's Queen Lily up there. We have a painting of her. And uh, basically, she was backstabbed. Uh, they told Queen Lily that they weren't going to take over Hawaii. They got there and they saw the sugar and they were like, oh. And then they secretly took it over by sending Marines there and they said, hey, uh, by the way, this belongs to the U.S. now. Okay? So, you can see the deal. Cuban sugar, U.S. sugar, Hawaiian sugar. It's all about, at the end of the day, what do imperialists want? It's all about that right there. Money. Okay? All right. I know this is a huge, big topic, but hopefully you're getting it. So we're dealing with Spanish in Cuba. we got to deal with Spanish in the Philippines. Hawaii's right in the middle. Huh, let's go there. Okay, let's go there. And, uh, oh, by the way, it's awesome, and we can make lots of money here. Let's take it over. That's what happened. All right. All right. So here we go. All right. Last topic. This one, this one really is not so good at all. This one really kind of makes me sad. Okay? So the Philippines, like I said, were controlled by Spain. So the Philippines are over, they're pretty close to China, okay? The Philippines were controlled by Spain. And the Filipino people, and you changed the spelling, I don't know why. 
the Filipino people were revolting against the Spanish. They said, hey, Spain, we don't want y'all here anymore, just like the Cubans don't want y'all. We, we are done with y'all, okay? And America, this is towards the end of the war, America wins the war against the Spanish, okay? And uh, the Spanish are like, look, we don't want to deal with this Filipino problem. Uh, these people, they're revolting. We don't want to deal with it. Here, why don't y'all buy the Philippines from us for only $20 million? So it's two governments, two governments selling a country. Isn't that, if that's not imperialism, I don't know what it is. Uh, for $20 million, okay? And the Filipino people, they're like, okay, United States, y'all want to come here and try to take us over? Uh, you're going to have to fight us now. Here's the problem though. America responded with a ton of force. Uh, they had superior weapons, they had superior, superior firepower, and they took over. They sent way too much force. Look what it says. Over a million Filipino people were killed. That's a lot of people. Over a million Filipino people were killed by the American military. Um, finally, the Philippines were granted independence after World War II. But uh, for a long time, the United States controlled the Philippines, and it's just not a very good history at all. Um, uh, the, the American military killed over a million Filipinos just because the Philippine people, the Filipinos were um, revolting. They're saying, look, you can't come over here and try and take us over. We're going to fight back. And the United States said, okay. And they brought in a ton of this and killed a lot of people. It's really not good at all. Not good at all. All right, moving on. So, some cartoons. You can see another racist uh, cartoon here, Uncle Sam chasing the Filipino guy, uh, and he's dressed, uh, you know, in native, native stuff, okay? Uh, check this out, you've got Uncle Sam, he's looking on, and it says, true history of the war in the Philippines, and the guy's saying, no way, it's locked, okay? Uh, under private, uh, it says President William McKinley, all right? And then it says, after all, the Philippines are only the stepping stone to China. And we talked about that one earlier. Okay? All right. Man, I don't like talking about that part of war. Not good. Not good at all. Okay. So where does all of this come from? Where does this idea come from that uh, America can go and just kind of take over and be really forceful? Well, it comes from this. It's an idea called the Roosevelt Corollary. Roosevelt Corollary. And what this does is it says, hey... If you're in the Western Hemisphere and you start to kind of start revolting or whatever, the United States is allowed to use force. This is where the United States kind of becomes an international police force. You may have heard America referred to as the world police before. This is kind of where it comes from. It's Roosevelt using the military to do a lot of force. So remember I told you before that Roosevelt is a good guy for America and kind of a bad guy for the rest of the world. This is what I was talking about here. It's because Roosevelt really gets kind of into that idea that America is strong, America is superior, America is the best, and he starts trying to flex on people basically. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. So the Roosevelt Corollary is basically the idea that the United States can kind of take care of everything in the Western Hemisphere and really kind of around the world we're going to see later in this class, okay? So the Roosevelt Corollary, international police power through the United States, okay? The sun's kind of coming out. Let me see how the glare is looking. All right, we're doing good. 38 minutes in, too. Not bad. Let's see if we can keep it under an hour today, okay? All right, now, one thing that comes about as a result of all this thing, through the United States winning the Spanish-American War, uh, so let me write down a couple of things that'll explain this. So we won Spanish-American War. So now we are the strongest European-based country, you know, with, with America was formed from, from Europeans, okay? We won the Spanish-American War, so now we are the strongest power in the Western Hemisphere. So we're the strongest. Okay? So, and then we get the Roosevelt Corollary. And what does that say? The United States is kind of like a world police force. And I'll talk more about what that means in just a little while. Because of these two things, because we are now strong. Let me see, strong, that's a muscle and that's a hand, okay? America's strong. And because of the world police force through the Roosevelt Corollary, we decide, hey, now we want to build a way to make lots of money. We need to stop having to go around South America. We need to have a way to get to the Philippines and to get to Hawaii and eventually to get to China so we can make lots and lots of money. 
we got to figure out a quicker way to do that because we're losing money by doing this. So, Roosevelt and the U.S. government, through all these complicated treaties and through all this weirdness, they come up with an idea to build a canal, and a canal is a man-made waterway to go right through Central America, right here, okay? It cuts through, it's a massive project, huge project, and it cuts through and it shortens the journey by quite a lot. So you see, if you go through the Panama Canal, it's only 5,200 miles. If you go all the way around South America, 13,000 miles, so more than double the distance, okay? So, this was a huge, huge project, okay? Cost thousands of lives. They didn't understand that mosquitoes were making people sick and killing people, so malaria was a huge problem. Cost over $9 trillion in today's money. It's $500 million back then. Nine, nine trillion million. This is massive. And uh, it was uh, controlled by the U.S. until 1979. Um, but still, I mean, the U.S. is probably the one sending in the most amount of stuff through there right now. So the U.S. is probably still making tons and tons and tons of money off this. Okay? So the Panama Canal. Roosevelt really flexing on everybody. And Roosevelt really saying like, hey, that we control this part of the world. We are the world police now. And we want to have this Panama Canal. Okay? Now, finally, when America wins this thing, and it comes because of this guy, look right here. There he is, old TR. That's Teddy Roosevelt right there. They win this really impressive battle where it's basically just an average group of guys, some cowboys like Roosevelt that are in the military. They get together and they call themselves the Rough Riders, and they win this huge battle over the Spanish that they really shouldn't have won. Um, and it's just a huge confidence boost for America. And because of yellow journalism and things like that, Americans see this and they're like, whoa, these cowboys, these true Americans, and Roosevelt, who's not president yet, but is going to be, they defeated the Spanish? Man, maybe imperialism is the right way. So this is when imperialism really takes off and people are down with Roosevelt and they're like, man, strong president, he's awesome. They defeated the Spanish in Cuba. Sweet, good job, uh, Rough Riders. Good job, Teddy. And now we want to keep expanding around the world, okay? So this is when the game really starts to change and America is really okay with starting to take over other places. And it's kind of the beginning of how we got to where we are today. All right, woo, that was a lot. And we're almost done, y'all. What were three causes of the Spanish-American War? Well, remember, Spain was mistreating Cuba. Spain was mistreating Cuba. Okay. United States was interested in Cuban sugar. Okay. And then what happens? There is a boat. Something happened with a boat. The USS Maine explodes. Now, that wasn't the true cause. What did I tell you? There is a major thing that happens there. A change in the way things are done. Yellow journalism, which is news media that's really, really exciting. Okay? Now, why did the US want to annex Hawaii? There's really two reasons. Number one, it's a stepping stone to the Philippines. Stepping stone to the Philippines. But what's the other reason? There's money to be made there, right? Hawaiian sugar. Okay, so there's money to be made. All right, and last one. What happened to the Philippines during and after the Spanish-American War? Remember, what were the Filipino people doing? They were fighting back. So, Filipino, would you switch from PH to an F? Oh, English. Filipinos revolted. And they suffered a major loss. Uh, over a million died. And suffered over one million killed. million people. And I guarantee you probably never heard of that before. Very crazy, huh? Over one million people killed. Philippines men under American control until 1946, and then they gained their independence. But they still suffer today. They haven't really recovered from all this.
Okay? All right. Aha. What power did Roosevelt give the United States with the Roosevelt Corollary? He basically said that uh, America can act like an international police force. He said, hey, if you got problems, America's the best. We're going to come intervene because we know what's right. Okay? What is the purpose of the Panama Canal? Connects the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. It's good for trade. And remember, this all goes back, goes back to imperialism because it all goes back to this right here. Money! Connects the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. And then, how did the American victory in Cuba affect American imperialist thinking? Um, so this uh, encouraged the imperialists. It was a giant victory. And so the imperialists were like, yes, let's go take over other, encourage imperialist thinking. And let's go take over other places. Yeah. All right. There you go. Pause if you need it. Very good. All right, so let's go ahead and finish it up here. Here we go. So now we're ready for our last one in this group. US 22, Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. All right. So what we're going to talk about are their ideas and the reasons why they think uh, America has the right to take over other countries and the ways that they're going to about, go about doing that. Um, and this really, for especially for Roosevelt, we're going to talk about how his idea of the Roosevelt Corollary, what that actually means, uh, because I just told you it means world police force, but I'll tell you like where his thinking comes from. And it comes from this idea right here, and you've probably heard of this before. It is the idea to speak softly and carry a big stick, okay? Speak softly, carry a big stick, okay? And what that means is say, um, if you're gonna say something, say it in a nice way, uh, and if the other po person or country doesn't listen, you back it up with force and say, well, hey, uh, we said it, we told you what we wanted, and now we're gonna back it up with uh, uh, the strong Navy, strong military, and a butt whooping, basically, okay? All right, President William Howard Taft's dollar diplomacy. Dollar diplomacy, so diplomacy means it's how you interact with other countries, okay? It's how you deal, it's international relations. So what do you think dollar diplomacy has to do with, what do you think? Well, it has to do with trade and investment, okay? So um, Taft, he moves away from like, okay, let's just go flex on everybody and take over and fight wars. Taft's like, well, let's be a little more tactful. We don't want to fight all the time. Let's see if we can just buy people out and we'll trade with them and we can invest with them. And then, then if they don't do it, they, what we want, we'll go to Roosevelt's idea. And then lastly, we get to Wilson, and he uses moral diplomacy, so moral way of dealing with other countries. What he's going to say is, hey, American democracy is the best, and if you're not like us, then we're not going to treat you as nicely as we would treat other democracies. We want to deal with democracies. We want to deal with forward-thinking people because we're the best. But really, when it all goes down to it, it's going to come back to this, and eventually it's going to come back to that, which is the military, okay? So, the age of imperialism, these are our imperialist presidents. We got Roosevelt, we got Taft, and we got Wilson. They all have kind of different ideas, but they all kind of go back to the same thing. It's America wanting to flex on everybody and kind of take over other parts of the world. So, let's get into the specifics. Okay, so. Like I said before, uh, Roosevelt's idea is to speak softly and carry a big stick. And he says, you will go far if you do this. Um, Roosevelt's navy was what really was uh, how he flexed on everybody. The army at the time wasn't really that big because we hadn't really fought any big wars yet. Uh, but our navy was going around the world all the time, trading and things like that and protecting trade ships. So um, our navy was pretty good at the time. So the big stick for Roosevelt is his navy. And there's a cartoon to kind of show that for you. So that is Roosevelt carrying his big stick, but notice he's pulling the Navy to really be his strength, okay? Um, and you can see the world's constable, that means police officer, the Roosevelt corollary. That's what he's talking about, is he, because of his powerful Navy, because of his strength, he can go around and take over places, okay? Let me make sure I covered all of everything. Yeah, and he also says, only strike when you're prepared to strike hard. So like with the Philippines, how they went over there and used way too much force, okay? and uh, allow the adversary to save face and defeat. That just means like don't um, overdo it. But as we can see, that's, that can be interpreted and the United States tends to kind of overdo when we respond with force, okay? So there's Roosevelt, big stick diplomacy. All right, dollar diplomacy. 
So dollar diplomacy, instead of using like intimidation, such as the military, uh, it, it's like, hey, uh, you want to be, you want to be like us, you want to trade with us, okay, okay, you're kind of, you're a good country. Why don't we get involved with some money? We're gonna pay you lots and lots of money, but you're gonna have to let us come kind of hang out there. You're gonna need to start acting like us. You're gonna need to be a democracy. Uh, and uh, we're going to invest in trade. But what this turns into, it's our government going in there with too much money and kind of taking over and stealing a lot of raw materials, or not necessarily stealing, but extracting a whole lot of raw materials and manipulating the power where they'll put somebody who they like in power so that this relationship can continue for a long time and lots and lots of money can be made, okay? So this goes all back to making money. And remember, from the Gilded Age, it wasn't always honest, okay? Gilded Age was not honest. And do you think these trends just stop? They definitely don't, okay? So uh, this corruption of like, well, we're gonna trade with you, we're gonna invest in your country, we're gonna, we're gonna pay you for your raw materials. They're gonna put leaders in power too that are going to be favorable to the United States who were probably getting a big cutback and uh, you see how that works, okay? Dollar diplomacy is not as successful as far as expanding as big stick diplomacy. Obviously, because big stick diplomacy, people are gonna be more afraid. And with Taft, they're kinda like, oh, okay, you're not as strong as Roosevelt and you just want to trade and you just want to make money, we're not too worried about you. So dollar diplomacy overall is a failure, okay? So dollar diplomacy doesn't work as good for imperialism as big stick diplomacy. And you can see why big stick is gonna be stronger because it uses actual military force, okay? All right, so hope that makes sense. So we've had big stick diplomacy, which is using force and the military to take over other countries. You got dollar diplomacy, where they want to trade and uh, invest and make money. But remember, this is a form of manipulation. It's a way to put someone in power that they like, try to encourage democracy, etc. Uh, and it's just not that great of an idea, okay? And last one, moral diplomacy. Now, moral diplomacy comes from Wilson. Let me see if we got, yeah, we got a picture of him here. And what this is, is it's the United States, like we were talking about earlier, it's that exceptionalism, that American, we're awesome because we're a democracy. We're mostly Christian here. We are the conscience of the world. We are the best because we are the democracy, okay? So uh, you can see, we can have no sympathy with those who seek to seize the power of government to advance their own personal interests or ambition. And this is ironic because this is a form of imperialism. This is Wilson saying, we love countries who are like us. Why shouldn't, other why shouldn't you be more like us? You know what, you're not a democracy. We're not going to trade with you. We're not even going to have any kind of diplomacy with you because you're not like us. You are not a democracy. You are not capitalist. We don't want to deal with you. You need to be like us. We're not gonna trade with you. And the United States is the world's number one trade partner, number one trade country. They, they have the money, so other countries, are they really get cut off by this, and they don't like this at all, okay? So moral diplomacy does not work either as far as a good imperialist policy, which means it's not as successful in taking over other countries, okay? All right. I know that was a lot, too. Hopefully you got the gist of it. Uh, Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy relied heavily on the power of the American Navy, which is a branch of the military. Dollar diplomacy, you trade or invest with other countries. To try to gain power there, okay? So you say, hey, we're gonna trade even more and more money with you if you put a leader in your government who is kind of like us, who is democratic, who is pro-capitalism, pro-trade, etc. And then lastly, how does moral diplomacy work? Um, you negotiate or interact, negotiate or interact positively. with other democracies. So other countries that are like yours, you love them, you trade a lot with them, you do really good, it's a really good relationship with other democracies, but then other countries, but other governments, 
they get treated negatively. And what does that mean? That means no trade. And if you're not getting trade with the world's number one trade partner, that's actually a really bad thing, okay? Get negative treatment, AKA no trade. And I'll get out of the way in just a second. No trade. All right, I know that's kind of small and the handwriting got weird, but there it is, okay? Pause it if you need to. And guys, I believe that wraps it up. I think this is the last slide. Um, let me check and see in just a second. Pause if you need it. Ta -da. And we're good to go. All right, so that's it. Uh, that is all for our standards. And uh, hopefully you got a lot out of that. That was a whole lot. Um, let me go back to the beginning so we can do a quick rundown of all of them. I think I've gone close to an hour now, so I need to be done. But I want to go through them just one more time just to make sure you got them all. Da -da 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 -da. That was a lot. All right, so again, basically, remember, imperialism, it comes down to one big thing overall. Now, we talked a lot about a lot of different things, but it comes down to this right here, money, okay? America wants to get to new materials so that they can make new stuff and they can sell it in different places. America thinks that they are the best because they are democratic and moral. Remember, they are the best in the world. American exceptionalism, manifest destiny, all those beautiful ideas of America taking over everything. And yellow journalism, which gets people really excited. It's exaggerated news. It's really exciting. And it makes people want to go do stuff like go fight a war with Spain and take over other countries. Okay? Interventionists are imperialists. Non-interventionists are anti-imperialists. Remember, these guys, they want to show off strength and they want to make money. These guys, they call imperialists, they say, y'all are hypocrites. They say, imperialists, you cannot be a true American and be a democratic person and believe in democracy and go take over other countries. He then, so they say, y'all are hypocrites, imperialists, not non-interventionists, okay? So, um... Again, imperialists, interventionists, they want to take over the world because they believe in showing strength and making money. Non-interventionists or anti-imperialists, they say it's hypocritical for America to do that. And they also don't want to get involved in war. And they're exactly right, okay? And that's what happened. Uh, the Spanish-American War happens because Spain is mistreating Cuba. America wants to be nice to Cuba because of this, money, sugar, okay? So sugar is a big part of this, okay? Causes of the war, Spain's not being nice to Cuba, Cuba wants to get it, or America wants to get involved in Cuba, then the USS Maine explodes, and that goes back to the US or the yellow journalism, uh, and then America's involved. And we need to get to the Philippines uh, by way of Hawaii, and guess what? Hawaii's got sugar. Oh, we had to deal with the Philippine insurrection. Uh, and also, let me go back to Hawaii. Remember, we took over from Queen Lily and overthrew her in a way. Uh, the Filipino people, they revolted, obviously, because they don't want another country coming in and taking over. So the United States responds with a whole lot of force and kills a whole lot of people. It's not good. Roosevelt Corollary, that's the world's police, where the United States is the moral conscience, the moral police of the world, and they can use force. So by doing that, they want to make a Panama Canal because they believe it's the right thing to do. It all goes back to that right there. Money. And access to Cuba, like we talked about before, it goes back to this, which goes back to that, money. Last topic, big stick diplomacy. Speak softly and carry a big stick. I mean, say what you want, back it up with military force. And a lot of times, way too much force, as we saw before. Dollar diplomacy, you trade or invest with the country so that their leadership is more like yours. You put people in power who are willing to trade with you. And you do that by paying people off, okay? And the last one, moral diplomacy. You only deal with, hang out, negotiate positively, do, do good things with countries that are like you. And with countries who are not like you, you cut them off from your trade, and that cuts off a lot of their money, and then they're like, huh, maybe we do need to let America come in and be our leadership, okay? So these are all forms of imperialism. Most of them have to do with money. Basically, it all goes down to money here, um, but those are all the reasons. Woo, that was a lot. Guys, it's great to be back after fall break. I hope y'all are excited. We've got great momentum going into the rest of the year, and I hope you've learned a lot. Please let me know if you need any help at all. I will do my best to help you. Um, please send me any positive feedback. Please send back any constructive criticism, and uh, let me know if you got any questions, mainly. You can visit my website and download all of this material um, and the notes, and uh, yeah, it should have everything you need. Please email if you got any questions, and guys, have a great, excellent day.